Before I welcome our guest today, we're going to go back to 2000 and see the opening sequence of Amoris Peros. Before we zoom out, so to speak, and, and talk about the whole of this film, um, I was reading an interview with you from a while back, and you said that the chase sequence of this film and the crash was filmed in a day and a half? Maybe two days. <laughs> oh, that long? Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a crazy, dangerous thing we did at that time. And just just to give us an idea of uh, not just talking about the setup for the whole of his chase sequence but but also the look of it as well um how you worked with rodrigo prieto on the process of not bleaching the film to create this look mm -hmm. yeah i think we at that time um we were looking for something mexico mexico city has a light uh it's a very high altitude city and there's a lot of pollution and there's a bad quality in the air and um, a lot of particles and in a way uh, there's a lot of grayish uh, particles that is not very nice uh, in a way it behaves with a, a normal photography there's always like a milky kind of thing and at that time there was this kind of thing that was happening about the to to stay with the, the with the film material you you keep the the, the silver um, and uh, normally is wash out. And uh, so w we were exploring, we were doing some commercials and we start liking it. And I think there's, there was a big influence too in um, this uh, photographer that is called Nan Golding, which we love at that time. Well, like, I still love her work. I think there's a documentary coming now. But uh, I think her work showed that immediate raw nature of things with these colors. And Mexico City has a lot of colors. Um, primer colors that suddenly when we were doing tests, we found that the colors bring a kind of a, a different te texture of it. And, and that milky thing suddenly was integrated in a beautiful way. Instead to be something that was bothering, the film suddenly got like this silvery platinum thing and the colors and the skin tones were affected so and the contrast was a tiny bit more profound, and uh, and I when we were doing that, we, I said this is Mexico City. You said this is this is very greedy. Now it's a it's a 
it's a process that laboratories are not doing anymore because it's super, super dangerous. I mean, it's uh, everything that laboratory, all the things that go into the pipes is prohibited now in the world, actually. You cannot do it anymore. But anyway, at that time, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Mexico City. And, uh, and that's that's the reason, basically. It was in a style that was very proper to the to the film. You know, it's interesting. You've got this film that um, has three very distinct narrative strands, but you said a few times Mexico City. Now Mexico City is a character. It's it's not just a backdrop in the way that you look at some cities in films. Yeah, Mexico City uh, is not a city. It's actually in a state of mind, you know. <laughs> no matter if you're there, yeah, it's, it's a very, very energetic, very, very profound. There's ancient cultures buried. You know, I always said that Mexico City is the rum of, of America. You, know? you, you, you have these ancient cultures buried one to the other. So if you are in downtown, you can see the Templo Mayor and you can see the Aztecs there. But before, there, there was other cultures behind and on top you see the Spanish cathedral. So it's a very, uh, an, an, a, there's an energy there that it captures you, you know, and 23 million people, they say, but I feel, I'm sure that it's 30, nobody counted well. So there's so many people that is very, very energetic, you know, with that very inter interesting culture. It's very electric. So you mentioned that um, you were a, com a commercial director um, and throughout the whole of the 90s you had been. Um, read another quote by you where you said, I've learned skills by doing them. Mm. I just wonder, when I saw this film, it felt like nothing I'd seen. It, it just felt fresh. Mm. You're not someone who went to film school. Mm. You're not someone who had any orthodox training. The funding of the film was very unique for Mexico at that point mm. in time. I just wonder if it, this is the reason why the film feels so fresh and looking at the whole of your career, that the, the choices you've made is because you've never been part of an orthodox kind of linear passage. I think so. I think so. You know, it's hard to answer exactly what it could have been of me if I have a study cinema in a more conventional academic way, which I don't think is wrong. But I just think that the, the, the core of cinema cannot be Thought. So, I mean, I think technique in cinema is, um, is important, I think, uh, but it's, it has become even more accessible and more easy. The rules of cinema are, in a way, technically, uh, the craft of it is not very, is not rocket science, right? So, I mean, even you, with your phone, you have a close up, close up, two shot, wide shot, okay, next. Close. That's TV, right? That's the language of, it's a very, in a way, not very complicated um, thing. Uh, I think what it is, what it is said, and the way it's said, it's something that belongs to every filmmaker, and that cannot be teach, that cannot be thought uh, at the core of it, because that will come out, no matter if you know the craft or not, it will come out. So I think at that time, it is the way I shot this film came from from the guts, I mean, not from the intellectual analysis of uh, academic convention of the rules of that. It, it's just like, okay, it feels this way. I feel this way. <laughs> These are my my strengths, my limitations. This is the things that I count with, and let's go. And I think that immediacy always is appreciated. Uh, I, I when I see young filmmakers, I don't care about the quality of things. I just I always very connected with the way they express themselves and how honest is that. And that's what really at the end is communicated, you know. Now a lot nowadays there's a lot of things that looks beautiful, but there's lack of soul. And I think it's the soul that you put in the film that really and nobody can teach you that, I think, you know. You started an early collaboration with Guillermo. How did you first meet and how did you progress to this <laughs> this first collaboration? Well, I, I, I was editing. I, I, I edit this film in my home. I have a little studio, and uh, I was eight months like getting crazy with how to put together these three stories and blah blah blah. Finding the internal rhythm of each, and obviously, in being the structure like that, always you have some some space to play with. So it was an infinite kind of chess game. And uh, at, at the, my first cut was like three hours, forty minutes, something like that. And I and anyway, I was go, going down. At some point, there's a common friend, Antonio Rutia, that he met Guillermo. They are both from Guadalajara. And he said, you should send this to Guillermo. I knew who he, Guillermo was by Kronos. 
Uh, it was his first film at that time, but I didn't know him personally. So he sent a VHS at that time. We were seeing VHS. Probably young guys also doesn't know what is that. <laughs> the thing is that the Yermo saw it, and uh, he called me at 6 a.m. and said, you know, this is a masterpiece, but you know, you should take out uh, the second story. Doesn't fit the tone. I said, what? Yeah, because I think so. He wanted me to just go with two stories instead of three. I said, you are crazy. Anyway, we started discussing in the phone. And he was very uh, certain about things, and I was defending my point. And even not knowing ourselves, we were already in a very intense kind of thing. And then at the end, I was a little bit irritated by his certainty. And I said, okay, if you are so certain, you should come here, because it's very easy to, 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 to say things, right? But not to do it. Next day, somebody knocked the door, and it was Guillermo del Toro. Literally, I'm not joking. <laughs> and he spent three days in my house, he eat all the refrigerator. <laughs> You're not supposed to say this. <laughs> My wife was not happy, and uh, and I it was it was an incredible generous uh, thing that he did with me to to really to go to a house of somebody, put yourself there, and you know get there and said okay let's work. So it was a fascinating kind of way that we met together by discussion discussing you know grammatic cinemas. I mean, what really means to be doing this, why this, why this? So anyway, the myth said that he took out, helped me took out 20 minutes. The reality is that he, I said that it was seven minutes. <laughs> he get mad about it, said, no, it's seven, no, it's 20. Anyway, doesn't matter. Even if seven is a lot of time and more than anything is to shape. So that was the start of a, a life friendship and, uh, and helped me to really get the film in a better shape. Yeah. Now, you go from having these three stories interlinking to moving on to 21 grams, where again, it's, it's multi-narrative, but this time the editing is pushed to the extreme. Um, I've watched all of your films again over the course of the last week, and going back to 21 grams, I was stunned by the level of complexity mm. in it. How much was that in the original script? How much did you realize that you needed to move things around during filming? And then how much was the film actually created mm. in the editing suite? Mm. I think the, the script and the, the, the shooting were very, very faithful one to the other. I think in the editing, I think there was things that I understood that it could be moved and it could be better. And I have to strip out some things. You have to clean things uh, during the process things that you like a lot but doesn't help the whole movie. So I think in the 21 grams, I think 21 grams, as you said, is, is the most extreme <laughs> experiment of, it's a leap of faith in audiences to connect things that doesn't make sense. So is this time and space completely shifted? Uh, I don't know if that film could have been possible to make today because audiences will be very irritated by, it. you know, people now looks a little bit more to be feeded by some much more, you know, by the hand, logic, chronological thing. But that film is a very extreme, I will say, film about time and space and, and how things, you know, this is a, it's a mindset in a way. At the, at the time when you were editing it, did you think about the film as being uh, a detective story or an investig investigative narrative, but for the audience? Not, not the film itself, the genre is not that, but we as a viewer watching that film it's, it's on us to kind of piece it all together. Uh, yeah, it's a film that is demanding, is, a, is demanding you to be uh, making sense of things that, that doesn't make sense together. Uh, but at the end, it's, it's very emotionally makes sense. Doesn't make sense logically, but it's very truthful emotionally. And that was the experiment. If, 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 if there was a... a, a a line uh, that can be followed by the emotions and not by the logic of the events, you know? not the chronological. The, it was not important, the chronological order of the events, but the congruence of the emotional flow. And that was it. I don't know if it worked or not, <laughs> but, I mean, it, 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 but it was, it a, really it was an experiment. Um, I want to stay with this idea of, of contrasting things. There's a line by you, um, the epitome of the human condition is contradiction. Um, and I want to move on to the next film that you made, which was Babel in, in 2006. 
Um, bef before we talk about it, let's see a clip from the film. Um, this is a very, very quiet sequence in contrast to the one that you just saw, but no less traumatic. Uh, Kate Blanchett and Brad Pitt play a married couple who are traveling around Morocco. And the incident that you're about to see, for those who haven't seen it, is the second perspective on, on this moment that happens in the film. If we can show the clip, please. So the, the reason I wanted to go, us to go on just a little bit longer, um, this sequence unfolds about 20 minutes into the film, which um, Robert McKee would say, we're going from the first act to the second act. You know, we've got this, this, this thing happens. And then you have the audacity to cut <laughs> to people we have not seen for the previous 20 minutes in a different country, in a different continent. <laughs> At a moment where we're sat on the edge of our seat, it's extraordinary mm. that you, and it, it's, I mean, it's down to your ability that you lift us up and carry us with you in this sequence. Did you ever have a second thought with that, thinking, wow, this is, this might piss people off? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think this one, in a way, I think, I think 21 grams is more challenging than this. I think the experiment uh, with Babel was, how to make the extreme, I would say, version of uh, stories, um, different stories where people will never cross, will never meet physically, will never know about each other, and actually they are absolutely related uh, emotionally. Again, uh, this is like the, the theory of the butterfly that spread the wings and then create a hurricane, a hurricane in another part of the world, right? That's that like something that happened in the desert of Morocco can really have a huge impact in a deaf Japanese girl and have an impact with two American kids and a Mexican nanny. And so those extreme situations and, and the characters never met, they never see each other, but they are all connected. Only the audiences, thanks to the time, space, juxtaposition of cinema in a way they can create and so this in a way works more like a short stories book like more like a Raymond Carver kind of thing you know so in a way it's not so uncommon um, in Latin American literature we have huge amount of examples of things like that I, I think a lot of Latin American literature is built on this fractured time and space we, we are very used to that in our in our literature kind of sources. So for me, it was not scary. <laughs> for me, it was not as scary. And I think that every one of these characters, when we were introducing the world of them and who are there, 
they 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 were I I hope that the, the people was leaning to them. Mm-hmm. It was frustrating maybe that you were already getting into that and as you said only ah why well, you cut to that moment, you know. But that was part of the game, yeah. But it's it, it's then like you said Interestingly, the yes, the epitome of human condition is contradiction. But at the same time, what this film also shows is that you can be oceans apart and still have this commonality between you. Yes, we, we, uh, yeah, I, I think that, that that people people in a way is happy in a different way, right? But as they said, uh, we are all sad in the same way, right? Humanity, we share that. What makes us really sad and what affects us is exactly saying, no matter if you are poor, rich, Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, whatever. The way people get excited or get happy is very depending in the culture and whatever. So I think what it was sharing them, it was kind of a common humanity about the loss and suffering about that, you know. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was it was about that that film. Now um, we can't really go any further in talking about your films without bringing up something that sometimes gets too overlooked: sound. What um, sound? Um, Martin Hernandez working um. on the sound of the film, um, but also Gustavo's music. Mm. Um, and you w- w- worked with him on your first four films. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's essential for anyone who's seen Bardo, you'll know this, that the sound in your films is as important as the image. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I have a better ear uh, than I, and I think I, I love much more music than films, and I think I conceive a film much more when I hear it uh, in terms of the music. The rhythm of a film is dictated by the sound that I hear, how how these sound. I have to define first how these films sound because that will dictate me like the texture, the scheme, and the, and the tone, and the rhythm, the internal rhythm of the film and how I shoot it. So for me, it's very important. Uh, I understand in that sense very well uh, how th- things should, sa- should sound. And with Martin Hernandez, we start together in a radio station in Mexico. And we were very young. We were 20 years old. And we worked together for five years as a host and DJs. So we were both having a a radio show for three hours every day, entertaining people, playing the music that we want. At that time, there was still vinyl. So we were getting our vinyls. There was no computers or something. So it was hand-picked, pa, 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 and then time. So we share love for music, and since we were 20 years old, we have been friends, and he has been the sound designer. So we we have a kind of a code of what is important in the films, you know. And as you said, I think sound, we, you know, cinema is an audiovisual medium, and that's why audio is first, right? Audiovisual, yes, audio is maybe 60 percent of the experience. I think, even when films were silent. Um, there were sometimes uh, some little music or some little effects, or even silence is sound in a way. It's an interpretation of sound, but I th- I think sounds really can can be an incredible part of the story or the sensorial or the motion, and it, it can be adding things. I think it's one and one is three. I mean, I think that the audio can make a huge uh, difference of the experience. You know, just thinking about your role as a DJ. Um, I just think uh, going back to my teens of making mixtapes more often than not to try to get into a relationship, which probably makes me sound a lot sadder than I actually am. Um, <laughs> but just the idea of, of editing a narrative, you're not just picking a song and following it with another song. Mm. And just thinking of how you edit, work with editors and, or edit the films yourself. Do you think that really helped you? in the process as as someone who edits in both in their head and physically yes i i think that um i think that uh, rhythm is god in art really I, I i think there's nothing that without rhythm can survive i think rhythm and you can say you can put it in a comedy show uh, the way you deliver the joke or you can say it even in painting uh, the rhythm of some kind of lines there's some or in architecture or in dancing obviously and in music and and literature where where's the dots where's the commas where is the lines are extended then the short lines there i mean that divert the, the rhythm of every sentence every scene how much what is the relation between you and i if there's a two shot what is the distance between you and i when you say something that affects me the actor how much time has to hold that silence to deliver the line, what is the volume of the... What I'm saying is 
the rhythm of the blocking of the scene, how they walk, the, 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 the pace of it, the, the silence between the lines, the, how they grow and suddenly how they go to the dramatic point and then how the that frequency, which is music in a way, that's the most, I will say, obvious example for us is music, but it exists in every art expression. Um, I think that's the key of the way something in a way can transmit something profoundly or be a little bit, the frequency can be a little bit hard to penetrate. So yes, I think for me, since I'm, as, I, as I said to you, I know how, I need to know how, what is the instrument that will guide the film, how it sounds, and what is the rhythm. Sometimes I try to make the music in advance, as in Birdman with the drums. Yeah. I, I need it, because if not, that will be impossible. So, and when I am editing or even shooting, I kind of imagine, <laughs> imagine that this is kind of a little, you know, piece of music, you know, to, to direct the actors a little faster. Here you get that. So it's like to be hearing something that is musical. So for me, it's that, that, that's the way I work, you know. Um, watching, again, Babel uh, the other day, uh, I was reminded of a line um, in Bardo where the main character, not giving anything away, but um, has this very long conversation, heated conversation with a former friend who is the host of a chat show on TV but thinks he's uh, a political commentator. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but the main character says it's people like you who made truth a fiction. I'm watching Babel. It's 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 not that the film felt dated in any way in 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 terms of the the texture of the film. But I was saddened by the fact that watching it, this idea of globalization feels a world away from where we're at at the moment. Mm. And this sense of a connection between worlds has been it feels like it's been torn apart by a very mm. toxic blend of of populism and um power seeking people. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how you feel about looking back on on Babel now, if you have. No, it's true. I, I haven't reflected on that, but I, I guess the, I shot this film in 2005, six. So obviously, social media, internet was not as developed. So maybe some of the conflicts could have been solved differently if I would have done this film now. I, the, the things will have been a little bit different because it's like when you see movies like guys running into a trouble and looking for a public phone to call somebody. <laughs> said really. You know, and so those films could not be made. <laughs> Actually, all the dramatic things about those things were about the lack of communication. Today can be so like, you know, ma'am, I'm here with the guy. You know, so what I'm saying is, yes, I th I'm sure I haven't seen this film since I did it. But what you are saying makes sense. And I'm sure that uh, it, it, it will feel a little bit like the things could have been solved differently, dramatically, by the world that we are living completely. Um after Babel, you moved on to Beautiful, which was a complete change. We've got single focus on one character played by Javier Bardem. Was that a conscious decision to decide, right, I've, I've done this, the, mm. the multi-narrative, I'm, I'm really changing gear and, and sort of entering a new phase? Yeah, I, I think it was, I was a little bit tired of the, the, the multi-structure. I thought that it was a good trilogy and different ways to approach different story getting together and I was getting a little tired about that, you know, so I, I like I have done that. I have done and, and uh, I wanted to say, well, how it feels to make a film about just one person, which is the most common thing. But for me, it was kind of, well, I don't know if I will be able to do it. And it was a scary to sustain one line of narrative and see how it does. So, yeah, it was a different uh, uh, thing for me to do. Um, you talk about the fact that death has weight in your films, I've just, I, I, I think there are a few writers I know who talk about death in the same way that you do, but um, it's never dealt with lightly, which sounds like an odd thing to say, but so many films do just treat it, someone, mm -hmm. someone dies in a, a sequence, and then you move on. Mm -hmm. You never have that in your films. <laughs> yeah, I think coming from a country where death is present and is so painful, in my country there's like 120 thousand people in the last years that has been disappear, disappear, <laughs> not kill, disappear. And nobody knows where they are. And there is no thing. So I, you see people suffering and you see things uh, when you have been exposed to violence. 
uh, in the real life and you know how it feels and what is the consequences of that. I think for somebody that has gone through that, I think I cannot find myself in a way treating and killing people without any consequences, you know, or to make a joke or to laugh about that. I don't know, it's maybe a, um, a, a traumatic kind of thing, but for me it's a serious thing, especially the violence. Is that the violence with no consequence, I think there is no reason to, to have this as a fun thing. I mean, I, I don't find it um, that has a moral gravitas about it so yeah um but this this notion that death has weight um, and thinking about javier bardem in beautiful but also michael keaton's character rigan in birdman leonardo dicaprio's huge uh, glass in the revenant and most recently um silvero gacho in bardo um there's a great david bowie line um religion is for people who fear hell spirituality is for people who've been there mm -hmm. and it strikes me that the characters that you create are the latter. And really, oh yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by the way that religion appears in your film because spirituality overtakes everything else, it strikes me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's more spiritual, spiritual thing, no? like an interior life. I think it's important that characters actually, more than um, anything, I think is to understand what is their interior life. And by interior life, meaning what is the relation they have with something bigger than them, you know, no matter what you call that. Uh, uh, and uh, energy or, you know, that you feel part of something bigger than you. And I think that make you wiser. And I think that ha make you have perspective. So I, I'm always very interested about the, what is the relation with these guys with that subject? Because I think that changed a person, right? I, I think if you, when you meet a person that has a very little interior life and it's just in the surface all the time with no consciousness, you can immediately know that, you feel that. And when you have a, 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 an interaction with somebody that has an interior life, there's a, there's a frequency that is exposed in that person, I think, you know. So I'm interested in those persons and how they deal with situations at the stream. You know? And beyond that, what's, what's fascinating with so much of your work, the, this interior life, the rich interior life that these characters have, doesn't always have to be rooted to a reality that, that we all recognize. It, moving on to your next film, um, Birdman. And you have a character who, whether it's his, in his own imagination or in reality, can move things with telekinesis. And moving on to your most recent character, who lives in a life that sometimes it's very hard to tell where reality ends and, and his fantasy begins. Um, I want to talk about Regan, but perhaps we should see a clip uh, from Birdman. This is a sequence featuring Michael Keaton and Edward Norton and two very bemused employees in the theater. If we can see the clip, please. Let me tell you something. This stage has belonged to a lot of great actors, really? but you are not one of them, really? pal. So you wrote your own lines, huh? Ow! I did. Yeah, actually. you wrote a few changes and you mumbled a little bit. You self-absorbed. Hey, crap. I'm self-absorbed. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, you nobody spiteful piece of shit. Nobody. Yeah. My massive hard-on got fifty thousand. I can't from. play with this dildo. Hey. Gets more than that. Get the fuck I don't out of here. Care yes, you do. Care. You care. I'm a theater actor, I don't give a man. shit. You care. Everybody says. Oh, Mike is so honest. Mike is so fucking truthful. Listen, I said in the interview your father was a drunk like Carver. Is that true, Mac? Is that true? No, no. Because no, my what? father was. My father was a mean fucking drunk. You understand? Okay. He beat the shit out of us. That was okay, though, you know, because at least he was beating us. He wasn't thinking about taking it. <laughs> taking us out to his tool shed. He goes, oh, my God, the tool shed. That son of a bitch would smile like it. Say, you want to get down on your knees and unbuckle my belt? Oh, oh. Or do you want me to take it off and use it on you? After a while, I made myself numb, so, you know. But my... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Oh, God. Uh, uh, I didn't... No, I'm... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's... That is... That's fucking horrible, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's also not true. See, I can pretend to be. Oh! Don't oh. fuck me, Mike. I'm telling you. You're a little bit crazy. You know what? You should start using yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, you have stage. no fucking idea. So, working with Rick and Thompson's like Waltz with a monkey? Huh? I might upset that. Yeah, guy. you. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Yeah? Yeah. 
Why don't you Come get on. your wings in your fucking bird suit, man? Oh. Ah. Hey! Oh. Oh. This is great evidence. You, you, you can be serious. You can be funny at the same time. It's and and carry the same weight and deal with the same themes that you you can in other films. This the, the levity of this film, mixed with the themes that that are being discussed, is is quite extraordinary. Did you decide? You know what? After Beautiful, I'm I'm I again want to change direction, but just float like a butterfly with comedy. Um, well, it was, I think that has to, I, I laugh a lot with this. I haven't seen it. <laughs> so this was so funny, these guys. It, I, I remember how I was laughing in this. I have never laughed in a set in my life. And uh, during the Birdman, I had to really put something in my head because I was ruining the scene. I went, uh, uh, shut up. And I'm like, uh, uh. I was say, well, it's in, it's in, you can be shooting and be enjoying it, which never happened to me. <laughs> Uh, and I don't think you should be saying these things. <laughs> why not? No, it's, it's obviously when you're shooting, it's a lot of tension, a lot of go things going on. And if there are serious scenes and themes, in a way, you have to be in that. But these guys, uh, they, they were making it so funny. And, uh, and obviously, as you said, but I think it has to do with, uh, 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 well, I'm sure it has to do with, um, I was able in 2012 to go to a, uh, meditation retreat and I think uh, it was a long one and I think that helped me uh, to suddenly get out of my own uh, mind and see myself and laugh about myself and be conscious of the voice inside me that we all have there's nobody that doesn't have so that voice that is a bad co-pilot sometimes like ah you should do that that's not enough you're an idiot blah 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 no matter if you are a director or you're a dentist or a, a taxi driver don't matter everybody we all have that co-pilot all day talking and uh, but in a way those exercises in a way for me, that practice in a way uh, when you can really be conscious about that and you see that and you just observe those thoughts and how impermanent they are and how absurd and, uh, and ridiculous, uh, in a way you can liberate yourself a lot. And I think that's a result of that. In a way, suddenly I could see the fun of seeing yourself, talking to yourself as a madman, but we all are kind of madmen. We all have that voice. It sometimes go a little bit further but uh, I think that was the, the point of this movie, you know, that somebody that is going through that. And obviously, in this case, an actor, which is the ego, plays a little bit more obvious. But I think ego exists in politicians, in, in, in everybody. Because, I mean, uh, so in this case, it was about that ego strangling this guy and I, in, a, in a funny way. That, that's, I think, the change. The shift was that I could see now in a, in a distance, in a perspective, and then you can laugh about it instead to be like a, some dramatic thing. It's not about the crazy guy. It's just about how our own consciousness can betray us in our pretentious thing. So anyway, it was a very fun experiment to, to liberate. So it was a liberating film for me. I just had this idea of uh, your own voice, Birdman voice talking to you where you think, yes, this is it. I'm going to make this film. It's going to be very funny. And this voice suddenly comes in and says, yeah, but as penance, you're going to have to shoot it in one single take. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't make yourself an easy life, do you? You really don't. It's... <laughs> no, it's okay. I thought that. I thought that talking about one person's point of view, it was a great experiment. I think it's great when you set limits to to the to whatever film you want to do. If you have rules. Uh, uh, and, and more than anything, like principles, not rules, because rules you have to break, but like principles. What is the principle and the frame of that? That at least helped me to, to, to understand it better, to be more creative. And in this case, for me, was that uh, I want to be seeing everything in the point of view radically of the character in order to feel that I am in his mind and how he experimented. That. And in order to do that, I decide to do <laughs> this extreme experiment that I didn't even know how to do it. 
uh, but it was in the writing, like to say it like that. So every time that I was pitching this film to any studio, it took me two years to get money for this. And uh, I, I was saying, you know, it, it's, it's about this guy that is looking to the end, it's a voice and, and uh, everything will be with drums. Uh, okay. And uh, it will be Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton, you know, he hasn't done a film in 10 years. No, yes, but it's about that, that he was Batman. Oh, okay, Michael Keaton. So they were doing the numbers about, you know, every actor has numbers about the world box office. And then at the end, and by the way, it's going to be in, in one shot. What? It's going to be in one shot. Oh, great. <laughs> Everybody reject the idea. So, I mean, for two years, nobody said, you know, comedy is it's about edit, it's about time. And... Uh, and I had a, a terrifying experience of masters telling me you will fail. So, and then at the end, I could raise the money, very little money, and I have to make this film in 19 days. We shoot in 19 days, the whole film. So it was less than four weeks to make this film. But those limits and those principles helped me to get it that way. You know, there was no space for hesitation, mistakes, improvisation. Existential crisis. No, it's you have to. <laughs> you just have to shoot it. It wasn't a spaghetti, you know. And there was no editing. So I mean, there was uh, all the all the shots were linked one to the other. So if one scene was a piece of shit. It has to be there because because I could I could not do nothing. So it was a scary, but that was a very um, electric experience that we rehearse every step, every camera move, every lighting, everything, and then it's one take. And then we have maybe one hour to shoot it. So it was the, 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 the to own integration, physical mechanics of the theater. And once these guys got that and the camera team and the sound and all the lighting things, suddenly it's okay, we have three takes maximum. Or the, the one in the, in the in outside in New York, when he's, you know, we, we have to really put people being distracted with the military band in Times Square for Michael Keaton being in his winnie, you know, <laughs> in order that the people will not be doing that. So we had to make tricks like that. So we have three takes of this guy almost naked, and we, we didn't have money to play security or close the door. We, we were shooting in New York at 8 o'clock with this guy running and Chivo with the camera, and, <laughs> you know. So it was a funny, it was a very funny, uh, very different experience from anything that I have done. You know? I, I, I like this idea that you had no time for any kind of existential crises and it's starting to make sense now. So you built all those existential crises up and then you put them all into The Revenant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because man, that is one serious existential <laughs> film. It's, um, I mean, you couldn't get two more different films. Yeah. And perhaps before we talk about it briefly, um, Let's show a clip. This this was the sequence that where my jaw hit the floor um, in uh, the Revenant because we're all used to those shots like the Thelma and Louise shot. The car's approaching the cliff, then the camera pulls back to show the cliff, and then we go back to the car. That doesn't happen in this sequence. If we can show the clip, please. It's an extraordinarily beautiful film. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to show that is, yes, you see the action and the kinetic element of the film, but you also have these stunning cutaways. And going back over your films, I, I realized they are throughout your work. Um, there's, there's shots of nature, and whether it's birds in the sky or, or cutaways, that you have this constant, constant contrast of whatever hell this person may be in, the world is still carrying on. There are still other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, how much of a challenge? I, I just We've gone from a single take film to this, but this has some incredibly long takes and very complex action sequences. Mm -hmm. And a shot like that going off the cliff. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about your work with Emmanuel Levesque and, and, and creating this? Well, I think it was a, a film that I started develop actually before, um, before Birdman in 2010, 11. I was doing a scouting location, blah, blah, blah. But it was a very... Um, um, challenging film and very expensive. Um, they want me to do it by some amount of money that I knew that it would be impossible. Because with weather, you don't negotiate. And uh, so the film, in a way, got on you know, hold because I didn't want to commit myself to do something with a, with a limited thing. I said, I need to really go 
and find exactly what that will mean. And then we can make a decision if we make it or not. But uh, uh, they want me to commit like with this kind of limit. And I said that that would be uh, bad for you and for me because we can get in trouble. Anyway, so I left that and that was it. And then I did Birdman. And when I was editing and mixing Birdman, the project, they, 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 they said, okay, we accept that we have to go and see if that will be able to, blah, blah, blah. so I jumped back to something that I developed three, four years before. And, uh, and I have to, uh, these kind of sequences, you have to really be very mindful about how you will solve it technically, visually, uh, how you will shoot it, what will uh, mechanics will involve to make it happen that piece of land, for example, that you see there, we have to go, we, we start preparing that uh, land uh, one year before. In order for the horses to be in that, we could not have horses uh, doing that with that territory because it was dangerous for the legs. Now horses with all the animal protections, they have a better conditions than all the crews. I mean, it was, <laughs> I'm not joking. So we were in these mountains and we have to bring wood, and carpets for these guys don't, don't get cold. And all, all of us were like, ah, and the horses were like looking for us, like, yeah. you know? Anyway, that's the condition. So to take care of these horses, we have to prepare the land. And <laughs> so, and we were in the middle of nowhere. Those kind of things has to be taken in consideration. And then I, was, I storyboard all of these sequences. And then she and I decide uh, with all the team how to, how to really make it happen. What is the mechanics of it? Like, if it's a crane, if it's that, and then with the visual effects guys, uh, 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 obviously deciding what uh, what are the elements to be shot and how we're gonna blend it. So in a way, it requires a lot of knowledge and technique that I learn a lot too, because then you are doing things that that obviously the the technical things exist and the approaches can be different, and there's many ways to approach it. But each of these shots were uh, extremely pre design decide before and pre-design and then rehearse and then make it happen so yeah it requires a lot of time of time to, to solve them you know and then laid on top you've got uh martin hernandez's sound again and the, 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 i just remember so many scenes of the sound of ice cracking mm -hmm. and then on top of that we've got the collaboration of alvin Otto, bryce desner and the absolutely brilliant Ruichi sakamoto and that score is beautiful. I wonder how much of a conversation that did you have because it could have easily been wall-to-wall -wall music and instead it's incredibly sparse yeah. but moving. Yeah, it was beautiful uh, in that sense because, uh, you know, uh, we shot everything with natural light with these wide angles. So we, we, want, we want to include the context of how those places sound, which is the sound of silence in a way with very little elements that make you feel present in this vacuum of space. And uh, so there was a lot of recording in place. And then Ryuchi came, uh, uh, which is, you know, I have been a fan of Ryuchi since four years ago. And uh, so to work with him was an honor. And that he came, he saw the film kind of an editing thing. He started working the themes. Then uh, we invite um, Karsten Nikolai, which is Albanotto, his artistic name, to add these electronic things. Uh, that were very interesting. And then at the end, Ryuchi was, you know, going through a difficult time uh, with his health and thing. And we, the, the film was very complex. We were getting to a limit of time. I saw a concert that Gustavo de Damel invited this composer, which was Bryce Dersner. And I saw this musical piece, a classical modern musical piece in the, in the, in the Disney hall. And I said, who is this guy? I, I like very much contemporary uh, um, classical music. And, uh, and then I found that he is the guy from the Nationals. I said, really? This pop guy really can do that? Anyway, I be, we became friends, and I called him and said, you know, what about if you composed the third act? And Bryce brought the music for the third act, which is very different with the violence and things. So it, was a, it, it, it came in a way that was convoluted. You know, it was not planned that way. Uh, actually, the Albano thing was something that was mixed, that was coming together. Um, but it turned out fantastic. Uh, I agree. I, I love that, that that score and that thing that. And Ryuchi, the, the thing with Ryuchi is that with three notes, he can just compose something that is memorable and massive, even when it's so simple. And I don't know how he do that, you know. But 
You know, the theme is just composed with these three things, with the spaces again. The spaces he got between the notes and the complexity of one harmony is almost a symphony in one drop of music, which is very impressive, you know, very, very impressive. And now with Bardo, you're working with Bryce Dessner mm -hmm. on uh, the score. You edited the film, written, co-written and, and directed the film. Watching it the first time, I just thought this feels like a work that you've been building up to for decades and that this can't have just been something that over the course of a month you went, I'm just going to write this. Is it something that you've sort of been piecing together? Yeah, I think in this film I put everything that I got now, and I think what I got now is what I have been getting or learning in the last 25 years. So in a way I think it's the best I could have done. I don't have not, nothing more to give at this moment. I gave everything in, in terms of what I consider is, is it was important for this film in terms of soul, in terms of heart, in terms of intention, and to liberate some conventions, you know, that has been for me a little bit, I get bored very easy, again, about the language to shoot like that, 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 that. So when I see that, I, 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 I don't have tolerance anymore to see things that are like that. I don't know why, but language for me, cinema is made of the language. It's like great writers, right? Every sentence, every word that is chosen, all the style, that's what really is literature, right? This is the same things everybody said about love. Yes, but when somebody write about love with, a, with, with, with something that is profoundly, is the essence of that, for me, the essence of cinema is the language. Nobody talks about that anymore. Nobody really cares about the box office or about if it's long or not, or if it's uh, entertaining or, but I think it's in the language and I think I, 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 I like to explore the possibilities of language. And I think this film in a way served that purpose to liberate from certain conventions that I'm a little bit tired or personally, at least I, I, I'm not interested anymore. So I think I found a very interesting way to deal with this film doesn't have any structure. This film doesn't have the only, um, gravitational center is, 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 is just an emotion thing and it doesn't have first act or second act or a plot or twist and things like that. It's in a state of mind, it's a flow of consciousness. There's things happening and, and, and I want this to be like a sensorial experience of cinema that it does not tell a story. Because if we think about it, cinema was not invented to tell stories. The stories were told before in, in literature. But then now the film, has become just like an illustrative medium to tell stories when actually it could be used in a different way uh, to liberate things. So for me, this film was very liberated, liberating, very personal. Took me years to try to understand how I should do it. And, and the need, I, I needed to make this film. Let's put it that way. I, I didn't want to make this film. I needed to make this film. So I put myself to work and, uh, and this is what, what came, you know. It's an extraordinary film, and we're going to see a clip of it now before I open the floor to questions. I think we have some roving mics. Um... Before uh, I started meditating, I think that it was very intense, right? When you are young, and I, the drama was drama. And I think in some films, in the first four films, I put people, audiences, and myself um, under the water, diving with the weight of uh, tons of water on top of you with some kind of oxygen tanks that were kind of... Uh, uh, you know, finishing the oxygen and the darkness and whales there. So it was very heavy, right? I put audiences in the depth of the ocean. And I think that in this film, I feel that um, the ref or the metaphor of diving is that when you are dive, when you are um, not diving, when you are snorkeling, actually you can see the depth of the ocean. But at the same time, see the 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 the, the layers of, of of darkness, right? You you from the surface, you are safe, 
you don't have to be in the bottom to see the depth of life, right? So in a way, you can observe the light, then you can see the grace, and then you can see the dark. And that gives you the whole range of what life experience is without denying the darkest sides of it or the shadow that we all project or whatever you would like. But I think this film, in a way, feels, at least for, for me, as uh, because my age, I can, in a way, observe things that probably were very dramatic or very painful in a personal way, but now I can laugh about it because I could see the light. You know, there's this song of Leonard Cohen, which is beautiful, that said something like, there's a crack in everything, but that's where the lights come in, right? So that's what I love about it, that you can see pain, but through the light way. So that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it has to be with uh, maybe I in my first films, in my first I think four films, I was obsessed with the with the forty millimeters lens, which is was the way I saw that we see in forty millimeters, no, or thirty five, forty. That's our eye kind of range, and and I was very obsessed with um, with the stories that the faces of the actors or the characters that I was finding. It, it was telling me I was much more kind of focused in in the in the in the features and eyes and you know this this was for me almost obsessive so I was shooting a lot with the sometimes handheld camera and getting to that and then I got tired about that and uh, and suddenly I found myself very uh, kind of shifting kind of thing saying wait a minute um, the context as you said in a way, uh, the universe and the atmospheres that these characters go through inform us a lot about who they are and how they deal with and make me feel very different, which is super scary. So, I mean, when you get a uh, 70 millimeters uh, wide lens, you know, when I shoot like a medium, you know, I, everything else is, it can be a piece of shit. They just have a good light and that's it. But that doesn't exist, right? That's... Uh, but when you have that, you have to create the whole world around it, from extras in the foreground, middle ground, blah, blah, and then all the cells, I mean, everything. The, and then where you hide the light. So the technique and the approach and everything change, even the performance of this guy, the distance about that. So in a way for me, it was a shift that maybe has to do again with this meditation thing that's only I got a little bit less intense and I want to see again the context of it and not only the ah. So I think it has to do with distance to perspective. So yeah, I, I love now, I, I think now what I like that in sometimes in the same moment is not only wide boring shots, but that, that the movement and the way the actors relate to the camera that comes to the middle and then to close-ups and then the camera moves. So the liquidity or the liquid, you know, like the elasticity of a shot that becomes many uh, frames or different from a close-up to a wide thing in the same thing, for me, that's accelerating now. That's what really excites me. When that works, maybe people doesn't like it, but I really like that now. Well, I think that's a, that's a tough one because I think depend on the material that you have and the possibilities that you are willing to accept, you know? I think, uh, it, yeah, it's about how, how, how much you will be allowed to be um, uh, uh, challenged by, by different ways to get the same ideas that you never conceive, how flexible you are. I think that that will depend on that, I think, because when you are editing, it's very hard. We got stuck in our own kind of narrative, right? And you love things. Um, this is the discussion with Guillermo el Toro. It's a battle, right? And I, I think we have, you have to be, my suggestion will be, as, as I, I suggest myself, it's not easy, but is I think is that you have to be uh, aware of how sometimes your notions of what you consider was great um, as a notion uh, is challenged by reality and suddenly you realize that it's not working as good as you thought or people is telling you that it's not connecting things as you thought they will be understanding or whatever. And uh, 
And I think you should be just aware that the notions doesn't count. I mean, I think you can really play with the material in 100,000 ways. And I'm sure you will get away. It's just how flexible you are. It is just that. I'm sure that you have the material. It's just you have to break your own notions, which is super hard, and kill your darlings, as Faulkner said that, right? The things that you sometimes love more is the things that really are blocking the energy of the whole thing, and you have to kill them to make the whole thing to live. To live. Because maybe some things that are not working are the ones that maybe you like better, and those are the hardest to get out of the film. But you have to do it. What I have learned is that um, the less you said to an actor, the better. It, it, the, with the right information, because you can overwhelm actors easily, you know, if you said, if, if you get them a lot of amount of information. I think there's different approaches that actors have their own style or schools they come from. And some of them are inside out, some of them are outside in, meaning that a lot of, some of them really need a lot of information like I, what, what, why this, what, what this guy uh, ate when he was a kid? Well, I don't know. <laughs> what is the wine that he has? Does he likes burgundy or does he like? <sighs> and those things can get you crazy. So you just have to bullshit your actor. Say yes, it's burgundy. <laughs> I know, I know everything about my thing. But they need those things to really process their story. Blah blah blah. And there's guys that are you know outside in, which is like they you see the space. They just put the cloth, they understand by physical exterior things, and then from the outside they create internally, and they just need very basic things. So that's one thing. But you, you will have to know what kind of actor is that, and you will have to provide that. I think the other thing that I have learned is that, you know, I think th there's a very uh, crucial element about what this character wants, you know, and how he will get it. And I think that's the only important thing. You know, for them, it's like what he wants at this moment, and how you will get it. Because there's many ways to get exactly what you want, right? By seducing somebody, by threatening somebody. So the action verbs, which are very difficult to define for me at least, I work a lot in advance in every scene. I write down uh, what is exactly in the conflict, what is the conflict about, what this character and what this character wants each of them and how each of them will fight for it. And I try to get some action verbs that actually can serve the actors to get that. And if that action verb doesn't work, because I think you, what I'm saying is be careful about the adjectives. Like, yeah, you have to be sexy. So the sexy doesn't mean nothing. But you can say, let's seduce somebody. Like, so those, in a way, takes a lot of time for you to work, to be clear in what is that, and then just give that. And, and I, I, I think that that has worked for me a lot. And then they know what you want and what the character needs, and then they can execute it. And the last thing is that, you know, there's this big discussion about if improvisation, the the immediate moment, and the, the compared to the rehearsed mechanical, this deep discussion about it. Right? There's two approaches. Right? Like. I don't want to rehearse, I don't want to talk about it, let's just jump, have the camera, and whatever happens is going to be the magic of the moment. The problem with the magic of the moment is that sometimes it's true, but sometimes you is unreliable. I mean, sometimes it doesn't happen. So for me, what I have learned is to rehearse, to go deep in what these characters, you know, what they need, uh, the, the, the depth and the soul of them, then to rehearse mechanically, perfectly, almost, again, like a theater play, in order that they own the words, that they own the text, that they own every step physically integrated, put it in their body, integrated to their body. And then when they liberate from all those needs, right, the text, they can say it, you know, upside down. They can do the scene even with the eyes closed. Then they are not worried about that. And then you have the camera. And when that turns, you have the beauty of the confidence of the integration of the body performance with the adrenaline of that moment uh, 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 that things improvise and, and it comes. So that combination I found that is the most beautiful one because then you they have a lot of confidence but they can be free to improvise whatever they want because they have already got everything. So 
So uh, I, that, that's, that's, that's how I approach now things. Yeah. Well, I think that um, you are right. It's challenging. But uh, when I went out of, of Mexico, it was because I belonged to a generation which, in a way, the country could not provide what we needed, and even in a much more extreme way. Uh, in that time, in Mexico, in the 2000s, only six or seven films were produced a year, right? And it was government-founded, and it was this, the same usual suspect, older directors that got the money. And it was a committee to select those films. And there was kind of a little mafia there. So it was impossible. Um, I think now, compared to those times, now in Mexico are like 180 feature films produced each year. So in a way, it's not so bad, I have to say. I mean, And there's these incentives that uh, they can re reduce taxes on companies. So in a way, they put money and then, you know, so in a way, what I'm saying is there's a much more healthy uh, industry now than before by far, but still always will be challenging to make a film. The, the challenge was that um, it was a way for me to, uh, to, to meet like an all new friend, right? I knew all the things that were tricky to shoot in Mexico to get permission from the government, how people suddenly is not reliable on some things, or even sometimes like, hey, you Hollywood guy, you don't want to come here to tell me what I do. <laughs> you know, what kind of thing. So when you return, you can find different expectations of people about you. And my expectations of people were different. So the great thing was the we had to adapt each other to the way I work, the way people work in Mexico. And I had to adapt to that and understand exactly. And again, like an old friendship that was in a pause, you re reunite again and you feel again the joy, the love, the passion, but at the same time, the contradictions, the paradox, you know, so all those things has to be worked out. And the good thing about it was that this film is about the guy who returned to Mexico and he find himself, you know, not, not from Mexico, not from U.S. and in the middle of everything. Once you leave your country for 20 years, there's no way back, right? So is this part of what I, the film is about? And this absurd, funny, and in a way, sad things about this reencounter that is always very complex. And the shooting itself became <laughs> exactly what the character was going in because I was leaving exactly that misunderstanding or that thing. So that was very informing for me <laughs> about the nature and the substance of Bardo while I was shooting with the crew. There was a lot of things that were happening that was like meta things that were coming out from the script, <laughs> and I was laughing about it. I was laughing about, and that happened a lot with uh, with films. You know, I have learned that fiction and reality are very tied together. There was one thing, so many things happened that were laughable and at the same time irritating and sometimes frustrating, but sometimes very informing. But I remember once that uh, shooting Birdman, uh, um, um, and Edward Norton, who who has this fame of being that actor that always challenged directors and complain about it and in, in theater I think he's a nightmare and he wanted to make this film because he said I understand perfectly that guy <laughs> uh, in a very funny way he's a brilliant actor and a very funny so one day one day we were rehearsing uh, uh, this scene where Michael Keaton invite him to rehearse the first time in Broadway and Michael as the director from Hollywood, uh, you know, Marvel, Marvel superhero films was directing or trying to block the scene with this incredible, prestigious Broadway theater actor. So the scene is about that. And I was directing the scene. Uh, uh, you know, let's do that. And, and, my, and, and Edward start, well, but what about if we do that? <laughs> anyway, and like after, after seven times, he didn't know that he was actually, in a meta way, doing exactly what the film was about and what that scene was about. And I started laughing. What do you laugh about? I said, do you realize that you are exactly doing what this scene is about? You are trying to direct me about that. And he was trying to direct my Michael, by the way. Michael, you should go a little bit like that. <laughs> and I said, you, you, are, you are. Anyway, that kind of things happened when I returned to Mexico, uh, a lot of them. And it was very, very funny. Anyway.
Um, unfortunately, we our time is almost up. Um, just so you know, for those who haven't seen Bardo, there are still a couple of tickets left for the screening next door in the Royal Festival Hall tomorrow afternoon. See it on the biggest screen possible. Um, the film is opening theatrically in November and then coming out on Netflix in December. The first three times you watch the film, see it on the big screen, and trust me, you will want to watch it three times. It's an extraordinary piece of work. Um, thank you to the LFF and the BFI for hosting this event. Thanks to Netflix, but most of all, can you please join me in thanking Alejandro Gonzalez in you? Thank you very much. Thank you.